means this is eventually, uh, we're going to share all of these sessions on YouTube the first week of March. So this will be kept for posterity. Just keep that in mind as you undo, when you do unmute. And with that, thank you everyone for coming out for the FCI live series. We're on week two. Uh, there has been a terrific turnout. Thank you all for coming out. We've got more sessions coming up tomorrow, as well as I think we're up to four or five in the last week because a few have gotten added. So if you go to our Facebook page under events, you can see all of the events coming up and click through to the registration pages. You do need to register on the FCI website to attend so you can get that link, that Zoom link, and we can kind of keep our security tight and hopefully not get uh, disrupted. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Also, so we can send you out additional materials. This team, like some other presenters has already told me, they're going to have some bonus materials for you that I will be emailing out afterwards. So that's part of why we have you register. Okay, and without further ado, this is a topic I'm very excited about. You guys might have noticed that because if you're in any of FCI's private Facebook groups for startup developers, start food club folks, I've kind of pushed this one. And that's because it's a really important topic that I, I'm starting to see we're not giving startups enough information about that you can get to store design stage and you don't know what this is. And that is actually a failing of the development community, not you guys, <laughs> you have never opened a co-op before. Uh, so we need to get this conversation out there. So when this team said, how about a conversation about programming? I was like, you're on. So I'm very excited about this one. Uh, we have the Seven Roots group team here. They'll introduce themselves to present on this today, all longstanding cooperators with lots of experience. And I'm gonna turn it over to them. Joel, you're on mute. I was following the directions and muting when I wasn't talking. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, just a reminder for those who might have joined late, uh, Jacqueline says, uh, be sure to check in in the chat, uh, put your name in your co-op so we can keep an eye on, on who all is here. So thank you all for joining us. Welcome to Get With The Program. We are Seven Roots. We do design and operation support for food co-ops. We're all here because we believe in healthy food access and community ownership and the co-op model. Uh, we're a proud worker co-op. Uh, my name is Joel. Um, I'm Seven Roots Operations Manager, which means I handle some of the internal project management and process stuff. I also do board and governance support, facilitation, and when I go into a food co-op, what I'm looking for is, it's usually the bakery. I'm, I'm looking for some sort of tasty treat to have later. So I'm gonna toss it to Heather. All right, hi. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I do marketing, brand work, and a little operational work with Seven Roots and do internal management. Uh, and let's see, when I go into a co-op, I'm usually, Two things hit me first. Uh, one is lighting. Um, so it's pure technical. <laughs> um, and then the second thing is I'm hunting for uh, the, the awesome, unique prepared foods item, you know, the dish that I can't get anywhere else. So that's what I'm on the lookout for. Kevin, how about you? Hi, I'm Kevin O'Donnell. I'm the prepared food specialist and operational specialist. Um, and it's not a secret when I walk into a store because I've I work in operations, form follows function for me. So I look at all those, why, why is it done this way type of things? And, and then I'm a, I love hot food. So when I go to co-ops, I try and seek out the local regional hot sauces. So where's that aisle for me? So over to, over to Nicole. Everybody, I am Nicole Klimek, and I do store planning and design, interior design, programming, merchandising, and equipment specification for Seven Roots. And as a store planner, I'm really, really into placing impulse items. And as a shopper, I am like fall victim to the call of them every time I go into a co-op. So I'm like, like beelining it to like where I, where I get the swag and the t-shirts and what can I get at the register that like I absolutely have to have in play. So Nicole and Kevin have a playful rivalry uh, in terms of who has more co-op swag. So <laughs> that's just a little, little detail to know about them. So our objectives for today, what do we want you to leave with? Well, um, I'll remind you of the great thing that Jacqueline put out 
which is the promo, which you probably saw when you registered. And we said, what's a program? Where and when does your co-op need one? The answers might be more critical than you know. No. Store programming is your department mix and the overall size and scope of offerings. And it dictates the success of your young business from day one. And store programming work needs to begin with the layout of your store. So we're gonna break down how your pro forma should drive your programming, which makes or breaks your store. So from coolers to dumpsters, to the sandwiches in your grab and go, you're gonna to wanna to know this stuff to set your co-op up to thrive from the minute you open the doors. So the, in terms of takeaways, number one, understand what a program and a programming is. So in an hour, obviously we're not gonna be able to cover everything we're not gonna to try to tell you everything we know for 60 minutes, like a fire hose of information. We intend to hit the key points, provide some context. So hopefully you'll leave with a good foundational general understanding of the main points of programming. So number two, not only will you understand what programming is, you'll understand what influences and guides the programming. And then once you know those two things, you're Hopefully you'll also understand how programming is gonna affect or direct operational and financial feasibility and success. So programming, what goes into it and what, what it drives. As far as like cleaning up. So with those three things, then you're prepared to incorporate the programming planning into your project plan. So those are the four takeaways we hope you get. So uh, logistics, I will be the MC moderator, facilitator, cruise director. I'll tell you where the emergency exits are and all that sort of stuff. And my teammates here will all be presenting as an expert panel of sorts. We work as an integrated team and that's what you'll hopefully see today. We'll be weighing in on our particular subject matter expertise and bouncing ideas off each other. There will definitely be time for a QA and a at the end. But um, if you have questions as we go along, put them in the chat. It might make more sense for us to address them as we're going through stuff, as we hit a topic, or we might just save it for later. Hopefully we'll have time for all of them. Um, so I think that's it for logistics. Heather? All right. OK. So uh, thank you, Joel. Thank you again to everybody for coming. Uh, we are here to talk programming and now we're gonna do something dangerous. Well, actually let's do it in the chat. Uh, we're gonna ask you, what do you think programming is? And there's no like bad answer here. Just kind of start shouting out some answers in the, do it in the chat though. Let's not mess with muting. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll just kind of read them out. Product mix and size of departments, the what, where, how, the look and the feel of the store and its people. These are good answers. Yeah, keep them coming. Something to follow in a structure. Mm -hmm. Why the word programming? We'll answer that. Uh, store layout, guidelines. Mm -hmm. How a store is cohesive, community spaces. These are good. I feel like we've got a strong foundation here. Anyone else have any thoughts they wanna share? The uniqueness of a store, yep, that's awesome. Right, okay, so these are great. And I'm excited because I feel like this crew has a, a decent sense of some of the pieces of what, what will go into the programming. So um, all of those things kind of play the part. And today, yeah, we're gonna talk specifically about what is the programming of your co-op? What, is, what, is, what makes it a unique place? And Nicole, can you give us just a dead simple definition of what programming means in this context? Sure. So bare bones programming is what you sell and how you sell it, um, including why and to a certain extent, how much of it you sell. 
And this is going to be different for every department within a grocery store. Uh, Kevin, can you give us an example? Sure, thanks, Nicole. So most of the time when we think about programming, we immediately think about prepared foods because um, we use that term a lot in prepared foods. And it's basically, you know, what you sell and how you sell it. And it comes across through our menus, but it's not just prepared foods. In different departments, it happens to be on uh, different scales. For example, in produce, your programming might outline what your product mix is based on some of your regional and seasonal considerations. So for example, in California, you may see figs and almonds and avocado varieties uh, as a big part of your programming. And, and then based on some of that, you may also off offer conventional organic uh, produce. And this may actually affect your refrigeration and fixture needs and how you merchandise those products. So, you know, it, it definitely comes into play in each department and just isn't limited to prepared foods. Great, thank you. Kevin, so, um, so where does store programming come from? Nicola? Well, it comes from a couple different places and Kevin and I will go through them. Um, the first is the concept for the store. You really need to get your community member, owner, visions and needs aligned so that you know what the community wants and you know how to get it to them. Um, the second thing that you really need to do is look at the competition around you and not just grocery stores. You want to look and see if there's a really strong coffee shop presence. You know, in that case, you might not want to have, you know, a barista in your program because that's a, meet, a need that's already being met. Um, does your community need a butcher or do you have one down the street that you don't need to have that kind of program? So understanding your competitive analysis is really, really key. The next thing that we look at is the physical space itself. So it can potentially play a huge role in your program, especially if you're heading into an existing building with say like huge columns running throughout the retail space. Your programming, it really needs to accommodate for all of those physical limitations that you have and really needs to be taken um, into consideration when you're laying out your departments and, and where they're gonna go and how they interact with each other. So then, you know, and after that, the, the next piece and a, a very important piece is your pro forma, which is the financial analysis and the future projections for your store over several years. And keep in mind that your pro forma is a roadmap. And, and it's just that, it's a roadmap. It's gonna have sales project projections, it's gonna have labor projections, and it's much more of a 10,000 foot view of, of what you're gonna see. Um, and it's important to recognize this is an integral part of the, of the programming, and it's, and it's always healthy to have somebody with an operations background to look at it through a microscope, to confirm that the assumptions that the pro forma is built on are accurate. So, so when we, we talk about this, we, we can look at the concept for departments. So Nicole mentioned that, you know, you, you have to have an overall concept for your store, but each department needs to have a concept too, you know, and it's going to depend on, you know, what you want the offerings to be, how much of that department you want to to take up the space in the store. Um, and it's, it's really important to understand what that drills down to from a pro forma uh, point of view. Um, and, and involved in this whole piece, your pro forma typically is built on, on what the board and um, management think the store ought to look like. And, so you're going to dream big, um, but eventually you're probably going to size it down a little bit because you can't do everything you want to do. Um, so you're going to start to look at what your priorities are, where do you want to compromise, and you know experts can help you with this because they understand how to drill down in a pro forma. And it's going to involve what your community needs are, what your member owner needs are, and 
you're going to use your market study to assist in this and you're going to you're really going to figure out where your opportunities are what's missing in your community and can you design your programming to fill the niche that that becomes obvious when you do this great okay so um just to review, programming is what you sell, how you sell it, including why, and to a certain extent, how much. And it's built from the store concept, the physical space, the pro forma, and the concept for the departments. So when I think of all that, what I hear is programming is the how to the co-ops why. So we've got this concept of why, why we're doing this, why we're starting a co-op and the programming is gonna be the how. So if everything goes well, programming is gonna be the driver of the success of the cooperative enterprise. Joel, I think you have that exactly right. And I think that the, the why that's why we're all here, right? That's why there are 50 people in this room and most of you are probably volunteers because you're looking to create something for your communities, for your neighbors, for your families. You're looking to meet this need. And the programming is what it's actually going to look like in physical space, in human interactions for that to be true. So, the other side of that, the other way to look at it is that the success of your programming, whether or not it's accurate, is also going to determine the success of your store. So if you do it right, if you show up and you've got the products and the services that your community really needs, that you, like Kevin said, fill that niche where there are opportunities, then you're going to be in a good spot. And if you are off, if, if your programming is not relevant to your community, that's where you're going to be in a really tough spot because the programming will drive your ability to stay open and be a profitable and sustainable business. Great. So programming affects success um, and it directs the operational and financial feasibility. So let's dig into a little bit more specifics about what it affects. Um, so when I think about a store planning and design and programming, I think of kind of a, a chicken and egg thing or, or maybe like twin tracks, like when you're cross country skiing, maybe um, one can't get too far ahead of the other because the programming it definitely affects how we use the space. Um, as Kevin said, form follows function but also the physical space might impose restrictions that affect programming options. So let's talk store design. Nicole? Store design. Yes, so people ask me what I do and I tell them that I'm a store planner and designer. And I am very careful never to leave out one or the other because what oftentimes people don't know is store planning is different than store design. Um, often space planning, um, can be done by, say, an architect or another general manager or someone else outside of the grocery industry. But it's that planning piece that really leads you to the design and the form and the function that will get you the layout and your fixture plan. And so I just want to make it very clear that um, store design should never happen without the programming. And you can't mm -hmm. put something into a store and say, I just want, you know, whatever is normally done or whatever is typical, because especially as independent stores and co-ops, and we are running in communities that are different across the country. So our programming needs to be incredibly specific to each one of our stores. So there is no general, there is no, this is what we do in every store. Um, so it's very important that you have somebody that is able to walk you through that process and then you know, plan and then design your store. Mm -hmm. That's great. Nicole, so what I'm hearing is that basically lots of folks are qualified to, to put 
things places, right? To do a layout and, and create the, the physical space, but to drive that success that we're talking about, what we really need is like the planning, which translates right now, here we are into programming. And that's what will will drive a successful store. Well, one example is um, we work with a client and um, as part of a development. And so there were options in terms of where to place the food co-op um, and of course, a range of size available. And, um, and so as we, you know, we, we did a couple examples um, and then uh, as they discussed with the landlord and the developer and everything, it seemed like some things might not work. And so they wanted to, to be sure to accommodate the other places. And so they came back to us and said, well, here, we, we, took, we took what you did and we moved things around and put it in a different space that's about the same square footage. So we think this is gonna work. And yes, they move the blocks around like Tetris so that they fit, um, but it, it didn't make any logical sense in terms of where the pieces were, who had access, who had quick access to, to the back of house, to the back room storage area, things like that. Um, so you really need someone who understands all of that um, to be able to put the pieces in place and have it make sense. Great. Hey, Nicole, can you tell us like, so when you are planning a store from a programming perspective, uh, what are some of the factors that you're thinking about when you're working on that? Sure. Well, the first thing I do is like, I just gather all the data, right? So I'm looking at the performer and I'm looking at the market study and I'm looking at all this competitive analysis and then I'm going to de build the develop or the departmental programming that aligns with the labor and sales needs. So um, how much produce and what percentage of sales will it contribute would be one example. In one store that is projected to do say 8% of their annual sales in produce, they're going to have a much different program than a store that's projected to do 28% of annual sales in their produce. So we have to take a look at the market study and the performa and really figure out what those each departments are going to sell. And then in order to program them, we have to understand that and how they're gonna work with the rest of the store. Um, the next thing I take a look at is the adjacency between receiving and the front end, because we wanna have maximum workflow efficiencies. Um, and because our distribution patterns are different than say a conventional um, grocery store, um, our wholesalers are different. Um, we don't get skids, typically we'll get pallets, our deliveries are different. So there's a lot of things that need to go into, um, you know, your receiving area and your back room. Um, and we typically have a lot more space than say a conventional store will. And I can say like the typical square footage allocation is you want about like 65 to 70% of your total square footage to be your retail space. And then the rest would be your back of house. But even that varies depending on the programming of the store. So that's something that we really take a look at as we're developing things. Next, we really take a look at local um, dietary and cultural considerations. Um, working with a store right now and they have halal food and they had worked with an architect previously to lay out the floor plan. And when I took a look at it, I was like, oh, well, halal food needs to be kept in a separate case from other foods. You don't have that in your plan. So when we were able to take a look at it, we ended up having more refrigeration, less shelving, you know, different drain locations and all of that just to make sure that we could um, meet the community's needs. Because if we didn't have that kind of food, like Heather said, we might not be successful. Mm. The next thing that I take a look at is the demographics, you know, age, income, shopping habits, race and gender. Uh, a lot of the information you get from your market study, but then I come at it from the shopper psychology. Um, and I really I'm, I take what member owners say they want and give context to how those stated wants typically translate into like actual sales. So um, I give the example of the people that on your surveys or on Facebook or social media are posting about how they want tofu. Like, just you have to have tofu or I won't shop here. You know, you open the store and you listen to all of those wants and desires but that person who wants tofu and has never had it before is like, oh, my kids don't like it. I'm not going to shop and buy that tofu. 
So you really need someone that knows what they're doing so that you can work through that and understand that people don't always buy what they'll say, say they'll buy. And how do we still bring that kind of product in and that service in while, you know, not having 15 kinds of tofu as an option for everybody. Uh, the last piece really is the merchandising and the equipment specifications. And I'll say programming affects your merchandising and your equipment, period. You cannot lay out equipment until you have a program. You can, you can do that whole Tetris thing Joel was talking about, but if you want to have an actual working document that you can share with people, you need to have your programming done. Um, all of the equipment that is specified is based off your programming. So if you in the deli are going to have a rotisserie, that has to be planned for. If you are going to have service or um, self-service in your meat department, that has to be planned for. And then, so once we have that full overall like design criteria programming laid out, then we lay out the fixture plan with all of the equipment. So basically store programming is the culmination of the physical space, the community needs and the operations and logistics. Wow, Thanks. awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Nicole. Nicole. So um, whew, I'm just gonna take a breath for a second. Um, so the question that occurs to me is like, so who decides what to put on the shelves? Cause like, if it was me, the store would probably be like half cheese and, and that's probably not a great plan. So who decides what to put on the shelves and how much? Well, so that's really a multi-step process and maybe your store would have tons of cheese. Mine would have like wine and crackers to go with it. Um, but really it starts with the store planner and the general manager. Um, first we lay out the merchandising categories to identify how much of each product category that we need to meet your sales projections. Like, do you want 12 linear feet of chips and eight linear feet of pasta, you know, and then we'll start looking at where do we place those in relationship to each other? Like, do we want to have baby food next to pet food? we want to have pet food next to your um, prepared foods and all of that stuff so that we start to get into that um, shopper psychology. Uh, next, we'll bring in your primary wholesaler so that you can get an idea of what products they carry, um, what their top sellers in your area are, and what else you'll need to supplement with from other producers and secondary wholesalers. Co-ops work with a lot of local producers and are incredible at jump-starting some of those new entrepreneurs that will help contribute to the community. So you want to make sure that you have space for their products if you want them, but you also have, you know, backup because oftentimes new producers aren't able to fill the shelves in um, a consistent fashion. So then what do we do if we can't have that bar of soap that someone's carrying? We need to have options and know what other people carry as well. Um, so then when you're all done with that piece, you're ready to finalize your shelving specifications and merchandising displays to meet the needs of the product they will hold. Like, I give the example of baby food a lot. Um, you can put like little jars of baby food on a shelf and stack them up. And that's just fine in some stores. But some stores have such a high demand for baby food um, that they would want to have something that's more stable. So they might have like a dump basket that's in in line with the shelf or they might have a front facer so that it's really you know um, symmetrical and easy to uh, shop so it really just depends on each of the products and looking at the rest of your programming to figure out what the equipment needs are excellent thank you um we've got a question so i'm going to toss it to jacqueline some of y'all are direct messaging me instead of putting on the public chat which is okay uh this one came from one of you all um what if we don't have a GM? Question mark, exclamation point. <laughs> so, lovely thing about that is most, most of the time that's what your store planner can do. So um, there are times where I lay out plans and we have everything almost done before a general manager comes on. And we can do that because of the integrated process that we have um, and all of the experience that we bring. So we've worked on you know hundreds of stores. So we know or we probably worked on one in your area and are at least familiar with the resources that we need to get in contact with, right? So we can get you somewhere that we can order all that equipment and still leave a little bit of breathing room for when your general manager comes in to make a, a couple shifts here, you know, maybe add some categories that they want or work with new producers. Um, 
But if you don't have a general manager, that's fine. Your store planner should be experienced enough to help you through that. Right. And I think that what you're saying is like that it's that um, operational piece, right? So it's that, that idea of, you know, what you're, we're bringing is um, that, you know, we've been in a store, we've worked with the wholesalers, all of those pieces. And so that's where, you know, if you don't have a general manager, we can sort of bring that piece in and say, okay, well, here we go. Let's, we're going to put on our general manager hat, think about what's going to be best for, for your store and your community based on, on these factors. And the great thing is, is that with an experienced store planner, they're going to know the right questions to ask. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a huge theme through all of this for every single startup is there's going to be things that, you know, you just don't know that you don't know um, those those details. So it's great to have on call experts. Uh, you know, you've got Jacqueline. Um, hopefully, you've got um, you know when you start to build your project team, you've got the right people who will who will be able to ask the right questions to lead you through that stuff. Um, great. Um, so as I think about the the programming. Um, the whole idea is you're going to save money and time and set up your store for success with, if you, if you have a process that incorporates all this stuff that we're talking about, if you have a store planner who, who knows to include all of this stuff at, you know, at the right time, which is usually earlier, the better to, to really set us up for success. Um, I know Kevin wanted to jump in with something at this point as well. Yeah. So the one piece now um, that you, you really have to scrutinize is it's your pro forma because your pro forma is really su supports you're basing all your store planning and design on this pro forma. And so if we think about a pro forma, um, you know, and we think about one of the critical elements of it, it's your labor. So labor is your greatest asset um, and it's also one of your biggest expenses. And it's critical to get it right when you, you do this. So think of it, the pro forma, again, almost in that double track concept that, that um, Joel was mentioning. Now it's time to look at the pro forma to drill down in it and say, is the store plan consistent with the labor models that we've put in this pro forma? And so, one of the integrated processes that we do is we take that and we put that through an operational lens. So we'll drill down it in departments and we'll say, okay, here's your kitchen design. You have this, 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 and this. And, and we'll look at your labor model and say, oh, you don't have enough labor set aside to run a service deli case, for example. And so then you have to decide, do you want to add more labor or do you want to change the design piece of this? So it's, it's another step in the process to confirm where you're going is the right way, to, right way to do it. And you have all the assets in place to do that. So um, it's really important to have a good understanding or have somebody who has a good understanding about performers who can drill down and substantiate what you what you think is right or wrong. Right, and and remember that the the store design and layout is going to affect your your processes, your people processes, and and you know that's going to affect the efficiency again, affecting the labor numbers. So. So we start with that pro forma as a map, that 10,000 foot view of it. And then we zoom in on each department. And, and as we get into the detail um, and we build the programming, we adjust the labor model. And similarly, if we adjust the labor model, we're adjusting programming. Um, again, it's like those twin tracks. So it's critical to have enough labor to run the department and the programming, but not too much. Right, Heather? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, Joel, I know you know that I know from experience, um, you know, opening a store, you're working on tight, 
tight margins. You're always working on tight margin, but in the beginning, you know, you're just kind of make squeaking and buy. And, um, you know, I've been there watching five people who you're paying stand around because, you know, the, the labor wasn't appropriately accounted for, you know, you're essentially many of you, you might be in this position now, you, maybe you've already done it, but you know, you're going to your neighbors, you're running capital campaigns. You're asking people to invest their hard earned dollars in your co-op. And, um, if you are watching people stand around and not work because you didn't make the plan right, or someone didn't make the plan right, um, you're watching your neighbor's money burn, right? And so that, that kind of, <laughs> it's very unsettling and it's bad for business. Um, and uh, so that's really the kind of the core of what we're thinking about when we say that this programming is so critical is because, you know, your neighbors don't have money to burn. I don't have money to burn, right? And so we want to be respectful and and kind of um, do right by the folks who are entrusting us with this responsibility. And that's why this programming piece is so critical. Great. So um, so we've gotten, you, we, hopefully we've got a good understanding, a basic understanding of what programming is, what goes into it, what programming affects. So hopefully now you're prepared to incorporate the programming planning into your project plan. Um, so now that you know you need it, what are the next steps? Well, make sure you got an experienced store planner in the loop early in your project. That would probably be the most important thing I could recommend. And, and make sure that as you build your project team, you've got the grocery experience needed. Um, not just people, you know, with close skills um, like restaurant or project management in other areas. Um, really, you need to be sure you've got enough grocery, specific grocery experience to understand the specifics um, that you're going to need in this point. All right. So uh, one thing I'm thinking about is that, you know, many of you might be thinking, all right, I'm on the board. How do I know if we're doing it? And how do I know if we're doing it right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Nicole, what would you say to that? You're in the right spot because Jacqueline Stewart and all the folks at FCI are right now your best possible resource. They have operated stores, they've sat on boards, and they know what it takes for a co-op to become a successful grocery store. Great. great. And like I'll, like I'll remind you, uh, again, it's a good, good place to put in a plug for, um, you know, not just ourselves, but, but any kind of experts that you can have on call um, that can help guide you through the process, help you ask the questions that need to be asked. So um, I think um, I'm going to put some. I'm going to put something in the chat here. Um, not all the formatting followed, but essentially, um, what we've got is the um, the overview of what we wanted to cover. I think we've covered the basics of it. So let's look at some of these questions now. Um, I see one just came in from Shirley. We've got a couple queued up from earlier as well. So um, how much should we typically budget for the programming process? Well, yeah, that is a good one. So um, basically the programming process should be built into the store planning and design process, right? So in theory, when you go out and you know, do pr get proposals <coughs> for store planning and store design, um, that's, that's it, it's all in there. So the key is making sure that uh, those folks that you're you know, talking with about that, whoever, whoever the person is who's laying out your store, who's doing your store planning, is able to take these operational factors into account. So you'll you know, want to be, as you're talking with you know, your options, uh, making sure that they are you know, experienced and understand how to interpret these pieces. Nicole, is there anything else there that you would add to that? No, that's perfect. And I would say 
budgeting wise, each project is different because all the needs are different. If we were to do a whole project with our integrated team, it would be a different cost that you would have to budget for. Um, but for anyone that has those questions, you can definitely give us um, a shout out later and we can talk through some of that and get you at least, you know, some budgetary numbers for you to work with. But if you have a 3,000 square foot store, it's gonna cost different than a 24,000 square foot store. So it's just too, we just really can't answer that exact question. Excellent. Um, so how, next question, how often should the store layout change to learn what works and what doesn't? And along that line, what percentage difference is there between the optimal and less than optimal layout? So do you lose 10, 20, 50% of possible sales? Good question. So when I first start working with stores, I gather all that data and then we have a matrix and some filters that we put it through that will help us reach your sales projections and hopefully be able to build in for like an additional 30% increase in sales. And that way you don't have to move to a new spot or do a huge um, expansion project. You're able to do that within your space. When we know that, we're able to break things down into um, labor models. So we'll take a look at how much it will cost someone to, um, for example, go and bring trash to a trash receptacle. There was one store that I worked with a couple of years ago where they were in a development and their developer wanted them to share trash across the parking lot with the residents above. And we fought tooth and nail to get that changed because when we did the, the math, it cost an extra $64,000 a year for that store to have someone walk across there all that time during the day. So if that's just one inefficiency that you have, I mean, when you're a club, $64,000 is a lot of money, but that's just one inefficiency in one area. And there are usually multiple inefficiencies. So we're able to take those and quantify them and, you know, talking sales and how much you would lose, you know, we can be like, okay, so this is like an entire position a year. Let's try moving that and then reconfigure and figure out what we're going to have for that matrix instead. Does that make sense? Answer? Okay. So, uh, Joel, go, ahead. go ahead, Heather. Yeah. I was going to say, Nicole, and then as far as the, the how often should the store layout change? Yeah. So it depends on each store and, and what your programming is. Typically we'll do like three concept sketches that lays out the amount of square foot each or square footage each department takes. So like you want a 2000 square foot kitchen to serve a 1200 square foot retail space for your deli, right? So we can lay all of that out. From there, we move into more detail planning. And sometimes we're doing 15 plans before we come up with um, it really depends on how accurate the performa is, if there are changes in the market or, you know, a pandemic hits or, you know, something crazy like that, then we have to adjust for it. But typically it's, you know, it takes about six months to get to a really good plan where you can say this is financially feasible and this is going to make us or allow us to hit our sales projections. And I would also add to that, you know, we have the luxury within our team is like when Nicole does a, a, a drawing, she'll, she'll shoot it out and she'll say, hey, Kevin, can you look at this and see if the flow is right from an operational standpoint? Does this make sense? For example, sometimes people will design a produce department and the produce prep and refrigerators are on the other side of the store. So constantly they're schlepping produce through the center store to that to the produce department and if and if you can avoid those type of scenarios in advance it's a lot easier yeah you know weigh the pros and cons because you're going to have inefficiencies in your store like we said there could be columns running up and down you have to know monetarily in your labor what each of those um inefficiencies is going to bring so you might it might be okay to have your produce all the way across the other side of the store and it might not be so we do like to take that holistic view and then get like into the nitty gritty. And especially with prepared foods, I'll be like, Kevin, like, is this possible? Can they do this? What, what should we do that's different? Great. So just like you can't have a, you'll never have a perfectly efficient operation. That is the kind of stuff that, that um, 
you know, gets Nicole and Kevin excited about is like working toward that ideal. Um, and, and so, it, you know, the, also your programming plan is never going to come out perfect. So what about planning for the future? And like, what happens when a program is more successful than planned? Is there something that you should do to prepare for that? Or is that just a happy thing that, that we adjust to on the fly? I will use Dill Pickle as an example. I'm sure a lot of you know Dill Pickle. So their first store, um, they didn't, Sharon will admit, they didn't know what they were doing. They knew that they wanted a store. They wanted to open it quick. So they opened a 1,300 square foot store and they did about four times their sales projections. Back when you probably know the exact number, but um, so they had to move right away. So they were not even in their space for a year before they outgrew it. And those are the kinds of things that we want to mitigate in the beginning. And that's why we build in some of that capacity. So for planning for the future, you don't know what your future is. You don't know if your community is going to really like your par bake program, or if there's gonna be uh, 15 coffee shops that close in the vicinity and you need to you know, address that then. So flexibility is really important for us in our fixture plans. And we make things that are able to you know, be used in the future in different program situations um, and also are affordable up front so that when you do have to have those changes, you know, they're not going to kill you. Um, but I also tell people you need to build the store that you are going to operate right now. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. You have no idea. It's just, it's, you know, a, a new business. There so, could be a pandemic. Right? Something crazy could happen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, we're wearing masks. All of that, like if you have a good solid understanding of your programming, all of that can be mitigated easily in the operations in the future. Um, oh, and when, when program is more successful than planned, that, you know, is always, almost always a good thing. But that's why we build in that, like, percentage, like, I shoot for 30, but we build in that capacity for change. And that per your performa will, you know, will show that growth over time as well. So that's, that's built in as well there. So we've got two more questions and we've got about five minutes left. So, um, so the first question is, seems like one of our first steps in programming is a good understanding of what our owners and community want and doing the competitive analysis. What questions and processes do you recommend for hearing the voice of customers does it help to do this by department, produce, prepared foods, et cetera? Awesome. So this is a good one. Yeah. You know, so I I love this one because I think that your best bet here is this is about building a shared vision. So it's kind of like Nicole was talking about with the tofu, right? If you go too deep on details, right, then you're a couple things are happening. One, you're getting everybody's nitty gritty, which it's not gonna be the same. And also folks tend to feel like you're making promises. And if and when they might see that you can't fulfill all of those promises, right? Because you can't fulfill everybody's obscure product wishes. It is just a fact. And, um, and then there's disappointment and, and there's a building of expectations. So what you wanna do is build a shared vision. So, um, you know, broadly, you want to talk about the themes of what they're looking for, what the needs are generally that they're looking to meet. So it might not be, I want this brand of expensive vanilla bean paste, but it might be, oh, wow, we have a, a community here that's really passionate about home baking and they want to see, make sure that there is adequate, um, you know, an adequate baking section and there are gluten-free options within that, right? So, and then that's where you'll work with the wholesalers to say, okay, great. So what are you seeing um, in our region and for people with these interests, you know? So when you think about, about those things, those broad themes, those are gonna come up when you're asking those questions, like what kind of needs do you wanna see met? You know, what are you looking for? What do you want to buy at your co-op? And, and the, the generalities will bubble up. So and if, if anybody's ever looking for specific ideas for how to, you know, kind of do those exercises and whatnot, feel free to reach out to us because, um, you know, we've done that kind of work before. And it's really fun to kind of come up with different ways to, to pull that information from your owners. And the other pieces, when you build um, 
that again, shared vision piece, it paves the way for acceptance with your customers and your owners feel that this is something that they've truly been a part of building. So um, not only then do they come in and say, cool, hey, this looks like what we've been talking about. But before you even get there, they, when you're looking at fundraising, if these folks feel as though they're being brought in on the process of, of building the co-op, that's going to, you know, kind of create that buy-in. So they'll be interested in forking over when you have investment opportunities for them to raise the money to build the store. So yeah. that's a great question. Yeah, and I'll say on the competitive analysis, that's something that your store planner should do. Um, I mean, there are times where I'm calling local businesses, especially now when I can't travel to communities. But when I go there, I'm spending a day just looking at local grocery stores, butchers, coffee shops, restaurants, and trying to find areas of need, but also maybe oversaturation or um, businesses that might potentially go out of business because they're not doing things well. And so all of that happens on like the site visit and goes into like that data side that we were talking about. So um, how, how does the store planner differ from your project manager? Oh, two completely separate different people. Um, your store planner is a grocery expert, is an equipment expert, is a programming expert. Your project manager, while they, it's advisable for them to have grocery store project management experience, they don't actually have to because project management is more of a system um, than it is, you know, a process. And so typically you'll bring a project manager on after you have some of the design done. You know, you're usually in like design development stage where you would bring in that project manager and they're gonna work with you on making sure everything is on track, on schedule, on budget, on time. They're holding meetings, they're keeping people accountable. Um, they're working with your contractors. So they have a much more expensive construction background typically um, and, and building design background. Great, thank you. We've got uh, one last question here and we've got about 30 seconds, I think, to wrap it up. Um, is there an option of grocery shelves on casters to offer more program flexibility? No. <laughs> and that's because there we go. Less than 30 seconds. Um, once you get all that product on your steel shelving, you don't move them often. Stores do resets every like three to five years is what I would recommend. Um, and that's where they go through maybe a department or you can do a full store reset and go through all of the products that you've sold and how much of things you're selling and basically refresh things to make sure that you're still relevant in your community. And when you do that, it's a lot of overnights um, and you're lifting, taking all the product off, putting it in carts in the back and then moving your fixtures. There are flexible merchandising displays for say wellness or bakery or prepared um, foods. There's a lot of different areas, but not the grocery shelves themselves. Mm -hmm. And one, one other thing to, you know, piggyback with Nicole is that um, NCG, if you're an NCG, become an NCG uh, co-op, they actually have programs where they call them core sets. So every quarter they're reevaluating some of your merchandising and displays and they'll suggest a, a reset and a core set. And it's all incorporated into what we do and the organizations we belong to. Yep. Mm -hmm. And one other reason that you want to stay as consistent as possible with your layout is that shopper psychology piece where uh, folks, they really thrive on that routine and the, the knowing where things are. And, you know, if you do a reset, you know, it's one thing for them to have to relearn it once, but to be changing up regularly would be challenging for, for people. And um, what we find is that if they don't know what they're going to get, they might tend to frequent another place because um, when you need your bread or whatever it is, you got to know it's there and run in and grab it. That's just sort of the, the culture we live in. So that's another piece there. Mm. Uh, moving shelves for community events. Yeah, so we usually mm. identify areas in the fixture plan 
And I'll usually put them in like a big circle where it's like flexible demo space or flexible community space or shippers or something. Um, so there are areas that we do assign, I guess, um, to meet that need. And that's all part of the programming piece. Yeah. And we also, when you design a store, there's, there's, there's technical things. There's pieces that we call end caps. And the end caps in stores change regularly based on sales and community events or seasonality. So there is that opportunity to, um, to make those changes in, in an operational sense. I'm going to cut in here and wrap us up. I can tell people are now starting to warm up <laughs> and there's more questions coming. A few of the folks from Seven Roots can stay past the top of the hour uh, after we stop recording. If you have a couple specialty questions, uh, especially on operations and deli for Kevin, I think Nicole, you said you could stay for a minute or two. Um, so, but we're going to go ahead and wrap up at the top of the hour. Thank you all for coming out. A really big thanks to Seven Roots who donated their time to come out and do this education with us today. So I just want to give them a round of applause and thank you them so much for this. I have sent out an evaluation. It's three questions long. I emailed it to you. You could fill it out. It takes one to two minutes. It just helps us make sure that um, we did the best job we could and are offering the content that you really wanted and expected. And uh, if you want to get in touch with Seven Roots, how do they do that, Joel? Well, um, you can email any uh, info at sevenrootsgroup.com is probably the easiest way, sevenrootsgroup.com. You can go there, find a contact page there. You could probably Google any of us. Um, and worst comes to so. worst, you can just email me. You know where to find me. So yeah. I'll get you in touch. All right. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start recording. Thanks everyone so much. We have our next session up tomorrow. Same time. That'll be with Ben Stenzel and Winston Esses of Columinate. They're going to be sharing some of their thoughts on what's changed in the grocery industry through the COVID period as organizers and experts who have worked with startups during that period. And thank you all so much.